Good evening and welcome to a special program we have on behalf of WashU at Brookings and our colleagues at Olin Executive Development. I'm Ian Dubin and I will be joined by our authors in a moment for a guided conversation of the book, Lucky. How Joe Biden barely won the presidency. Um, but first let me uh, allow my colleague, Sam Chun to, to say hello as well. Thanks, Ian. Um, so this is a, a welcome and a shout out to those of, uh, those of the audience who are joining from the St. Louis metro area. Um, thanks for being here. And um, uh, this is also a way of saying huge thanks to Amy and John for joining us to do this. Uh, it's great to have something so fresh in our minds uh, discussed in this kind of format. And uh, also, Ian, thank you for being the point into the stick on all of this. Really appreciate it. Bye. So we have two amazing journalists with us this evening whose new book, Lucky How Joe Biden Barely Won the Presidency, just came out a week ago today. The ink in the book was barely dry in early January. So this is uh, quickly to print. And if you have not picked up the book yet, when you do, you'll see antidotes throughout the primary campaign, the general election, uh, and because they're journalists, hopefully we'll get some insights beyond just uh, the events of the past year, but where we are in the political discourse. Uh, both John and Amy have been great friends of our programs over the years uh, and have, I'll uh, start with John, who's worked for pretty much every print publication in DC. Uh, currently he's at NBC News. Uh, Amy Parnes, his partner in crime, is at The Hill. And if you pay any attention to Washington politics, uh, you've seen both their names many times. Uh, I should point out this is their third book, the first being HRC, the second was Shattered, and of course now we have Lucky. Um, not a coincidence that tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, so. <laughs> The format of this will be uh, some initial guided conversation qu points uh, and then an opportunity for all of you via the question and answer segment to, to tee up questions of interest uh, with our authors. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Um, in the book early on, uh, you talk about uh, Biden being the front runner yet he didn't have the clear field, much like in 2016, Hillary Clinton, uh, she had a primary opponent in Bernie Sanders, but it was largely cleared. Everybody said she was going to be the nominee and you had a huge primary field on the Democratic side. And Barack Obama did not endorse Joe Biden early on. He played a neutral part. Uh, can you, can you give us some insights into that? Did he know that Obama wasn't uh, confident in him, uh, wasn't going to endorse uh, as he continued to bring in other primary challengers to meet with him in his office in DC? You want me to take that, John? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you all for having us. We, we're great fans of this program and we're so happy to be here. Um, so Ian, basically to answer your question, um, Obama and Biden have always had a kind of complicated relationship. I think that they are safe to say they like each other, but I think the former president was a little skeptical, um, that might be an understatement, about um, his former partner running. Um, and if you go back to 2016, um, and Biden writes about this in his own book, um, there was a little bit of tension there because Obama and Obama's aides um, kind of kept him out of the race. Um, they basically said, look, it's, it's not the right time for you. His son had just died. Um, Hillary Clinton was already gaining steam um, in the primary and she was already racking up um, endorsements and um, financial backing. And so I think that, you know, fast forward to this race, he jumps in and Obama has a meeting 
in his office. Um, he calls Biden's aides into the office to basically ensure that um, that his former partner wasn't going to tarnish his and embarrass himself and then tarnish um, his brand and and therefore the Obama brand. Um, and so throughout the, the book, we kind of have Obama kind of looming in the background. Um, and he's sort of flirting with all these candidates behind the scenes. He's offering them advice in his office. They're all coming to meet him. Um, and we have one particular anecdote in the book, I think that's um, provides a great deal of insight into Obama's thinking at the time. And so I'll set the scene. Um, Obama is meeting with donors um, at Eve's, which is a really posh restaurant in New York. Um, and he feels, according to people in the room, he's feeling kind of like a little looser and he can kind of confide in, in these guys and tell them exactly what's on his mind. And so they're asking him, well, what do you make of the race? And he's he essentially says, um, you know, he's he's giving his views on everyone and he's going through, through through the list and he's really giving what one source called a sermon about Elizabeth Warren and is basically stopping shy of endorsing her. Um, and he's forgetting a couple of people like Kamala Harris. He's jabbing Mayor Pete and calling him gay and short. And people have said that he was sort of ripping him. Um, and then one donor in the room stops him and says, you forgot Biden. And that was the moment that um, was, I think, illuminating for a lot of people because here is his former running mate, former vice president, he's in the race again, and he is not really saying anything about him because I don't think he really believed in the candidacy. So that gives you some insight into the history and why it was so complicated and why he couldn't really back him. So if we could fast forward a little bit um, later on the campaign, and you talk about this in your chapter titled Law and Disorder, um, the conflation of the two campaign staffs, the initial folks that Biden had with him early in the primary to post Super Tuesday, and once he pretty much had things under control when he brought in the Obama veterans led by his now Deputy Chief of Staff, Jen O'Malley Dillian, um, and a number of other Obama folks. Uh, and there's an antidote about a, a spread in a magazine about Jen O'Malley and Biden being unhappy and some friction. Um, and I'm gonna sort of fast forward to finish the question and the early administration thus far, you see a lot of Obama veterans that have gotten plum White House jobs. And we wonder what insights you may have into if this friction is continuing and what it might mean as the administration goes through what is, I would imagine will be a normal churn cycle and folks leave and come back. Uh, and possibly a re-election campaign that may uh, may come in a couple of years as well. To the extent that uh, Joe Biden is currently the president of the United States and there are people working for him, uh, they understand that they're working for him for the most part. However, you are seeing this tension that Amy was talking about that you just discussed uh, from, you know, that we detail in the book during the general election and really consequentially a battle over um, over whether Biden was going to move to the left on uh, police reform, uh, which he, he largely resisted. Um, he wouldn't say defund the police, even though senior aides to him told him that he should do that. He uh, refused to apologize for the crime bill, even though some of his senior aides came to him and, uh, and pushed him to do that. And basically, the set of people doing that were largely folks that came in from Obama world. Uh, but Biden is the president now, and, and you see this sort of fight playing out, not as much within the White House, but between the White House and Obama's ongoing sort of ally group. And there was a story in the New York Times today that I thought sort of perfectly encapsulated uh, what's going on, where um, there was a, a, a real pushback from Obama allies against the White House, because the White House used the Obama stimulus of 2009 as uh, a foil in trying to pass this latest COVID relief and, uh, and stimulus bill. 
And they basically, the Biden people were basically saying all over Capitol Hill and on television, you know, we don't want to make the same mistake Obama did by going too small. And then today in the Times, you see this pushback from David Axelrod, uh, the longtime Obama advisor, and Valerie Jarrett, a longtime Obama advisor, pushing back, saying that, uh, you know, that the criticism was unfair. So we are continuing to see this sort of Obama versus Biden uh, conflict play out. But I think for the people who actually serve the president right now, uh, they know that they're working for Biden and not Obama. Thank you. So let's uh, do another check. You talk a lot, understandably, about the VP stakes early on. And there was a moment early in the primaries that you talk about in the debate where Kamala was not kind to Joe Biden. And folks thought she was not going to be the VP because of that uh, debate. And it, the timeline for an announcement kept being pushed back and pushed back. And eventually, Kamala Harris, as we know, was named the VP running mate. Uh, conventional wisdom is the VPs don't really change outcomes of elections. You're voting for the top of the ticket. Uh, they're good to help raise money. They're good to be your uh, attack person. Um, what what impact did Kamala Harris have on the t on the race? Uh, in your estimation, uh, was it the smart decision uh, um, versus a heart decision? And if it, if that's true, who did he really want? <laughs> we talk a little bit about that in the book actually um we have a whole chapter about the veep stakes um where um i think one anecdote that sort of encapsulates how biden was feeling in the moment is he calls his friend jim clyburn um the house majority whip who has who endorsed gave him the, the pivotal endorsement in south carolina and he says i'm having a battle between my head and my heart um and i can't decide what's going on you know i can't I can't, um, I, I need help kind of deciding this. And um, Clyburn, he's essentially asking Jim Clyburn for permission. He, Jim Clyburn had wanted him to, um, he said openly wanted him to um, not or pick a, a black um, running mate, a female running mate. And, um, and I think that moment was sort of revealing in that Biden was, wasn't completely certain that Kamala Harris was the one for him um, and had been looking at other people until the very last minute, which shows you that he wasn't kind of sold on her, even though she was the front runner um, at the time. And so I think um, it's interesting to look at that moment and see what, what he was thinking. Um, I think that, sorry, did we lose John? I, you got me back. We're, we're all still there. Okay. Um, I think that essentially what she did was she helped kind of solidify that ticket and energize the ticket um, because uh, he wasn't doing so well in the beginning. He wasn't sort of energizing the base. He wasn't, it was a campaign sort of going through the motions and um, had a very kind of lackluster way about it. You know, they were losing money. They couldn't get endorsements. Um, he gets this big Clyburn endorsement, but then he, and you know, which, kind of catapults him to Super Tuesday, but there wasn't that energy, maybe that Obama 2008 energy. So I think in a way, um, what she did was help give him kind of a jolt of energy, even though a lot of people, even Elizabeth Warren's people at the, at the time were saying, um, she's not the one who can help sort of um, galvanize the black community. They were making the point that Elizabeth Warren actually pulled higher with African-Americans so, and, and Biden had the, that, that group, that demographic for the most part. Um, but I do think that she was kind of a shot in the arm for, for Biden and his campaign. So we'd be derelict if we don't sort of talk about the other side of the, the campaign and the opposition in President Trump. Uh, in October, you talked about uh, the president getting COVID and Biden's decision to remove the negative campaigning. And the result of that was a lag in fundraising for his campaign, yet they were spending lots of money in states uh, 
you you talked about Florida being the Iowa of the general election in terms of you have to go there, you have to spend money, uh, but wasn't going to do anything for them in the end. Did the lag in resourcing because of the president's diagnosis with COVID and the ambitions of campaigning in places uh, distract from the, the must-win states of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, uh, causing a closer election than it would have been? Or was it really an expansion of the map? I mean, what you really see in is a difference, I think, between the Democrats and the Republicans, or certainly between Trump and his two Democratic rivals in the last two campaigns, in how they look at trying to win the election. Uh, the Democrats will plan out as many paths as they can and um, adjust resources, adjust their spending, their candidate travel time, um, you know, the phone banking that they do into those states, adjust them based on, um, you know, the sort of priority of what they think, uh, where they think they're doing the best and how it best adds up to 270. So they'll talk about, here are our three paths to the presidency or four paths to the presidency. I think the Republicans, they do a little bit of that. They're obviously, you know, spending money outside of, you know, one narrow set of states to 270 electoral college votes. But I do think that they tend to focus more on what they see as the optimal path. Uh, even if they might end up having been wrong about that, they're, they're a little more focused on it. And with Trump, he was so outspent in 2020 uh, by the Biden campaign, he didn't really have a lot of options. And so one of the things the Democrats were trying to do was bait him into spending money, for instance, in Texas, uh, where he you know, went on to win pretty easily. And I think um, no one in either uh, campaign really thought that Texas was in play to the extent Democrats said it was, but you saw like Kamala down there, you saw some investment in Texas from the Democrats, at least as a little bit of a faint. So the, looking at some of the demographics of the election, uh, we see that Biden did better than Clinton with some groups, but not as well as Obama did. Uh, was the Biden victory uh, a re-energization or re-energizing the Obama coalition, or was it due to uh, newer, more diverse, younger uh, voting groups, uh, such as we saw in Georgia? And then uh, similarly, how much did the Clyburn endorsement really mean uh, beyond South Carolina and Super Tuesday. Maybe we could split that up a little bit. I'll take the first part, Name, you want to take the Clyburn yeah, part? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I think what we saw in this election was a uh, was the degree to which all these states are, are different. There's correlation between the voting groups and, and, you know, across the United States and various states, but they really are individual elections within the states. And, um, and to that point, you see in, in Atlanta and in Georgia, um, Stacey Abrams' coalition that she's put together um, has gotten stronger and stronger from election cycle to election cycle. And it's really uh, a turnout machine of Democrats and, uh, and particularly progressive Democrats and African-American Democrats. Um, and she's, she's nailed that. Uh, you know, in 2018, when she ran for uh, for governor of the state, she got 100,000 more raw votes in that election than Hillary Clinton had two years prior. Clinton running in a presidential year, Abrams in an off year, typically you would see a recession in, in a party's votes between um, the presidential year and the next the next cycle. In this case, Abrams got 100,000 more votes. Then you see in, um, in this election that gap from, I think it was about a three and a half point gap in the 2016 election between Trump and Clinton this time you know, Biden uh, surmounts uh, Trump's number by, you know, just enough to win basically 10,000 votes or so. Um, but something different was happening in um, the Rust Belt states that Biden had originally focused on, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, where um, what you really saw was uh, an increase in the, the voting of um, educated white suburbanites for, uh, for the Democrat. Um, and some of that was, you know, you're sort of never Trump Republicans who had switched parties. And um, some of it was simply just more energy among, uh, you know, Democrats in those, in those demographics. But the real sort of lion's share of Biden's victory in particularly in Pennsylvania, you could see in Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery counties, which are, um, you know, wealthier, more educated, uh, more white than say Philadelphia, the city. In Philadelphia, Trump did better among African, or, or he did better in the city of Philadelphia, I should say, which is uh, majority African-American 
than he did in 2016. Um, in Detroit, Biden got fewer votes uh, than Clinton did in the city of Detroit, um, even as Biden had a 21% or so increase in his overall votes um, across the country from where Clinton had been. So you see this huge um, increase in Democratic voting. And in the sort of northern Rust Belt states, what you're not seeing is a concomitant increase in uh, African-American turnout. But in Georgia, um, that African-American turnout was crucial. Uh, and Georgia was one of the states that turned out to be very important for Joe Biden. So the Clyburn um, endorsement, I think I think John agrees, but I think uh, we saw it as a very key endorsement, perhaps quite possibly the biggest endorsement and the biggest thing that happened to Joe Biden to kind of um, give him the energy he needed. We, I talked a little bit earlier about how he wasn't able to get the endorsements. His campaign was going into the gutter financially. Um, I, at one point, um, aides came to him with um, the idea that maybe he needed to refinance one of his homes. It was that bad. And so you get to South Carolina um, and people are kind of looking, you know, everyone was being promised that that was um, the firewall and that that was the state that was going to turn things around. And I think, of course, Biden was ahead there. Um, he had a, a significant lead, but I think Clyburn made it that much so and pushed him over the edge in a big way, bigger than a lot of aides expected even. Um, I talked to one aide um, going into that week, I remember, and the aide said, you know, I, a touchdown, a, a win is a win. And if we can just get the touchdown and win and, um, you know, and, and move on to Super Tuesday, I'll be happy. And, and no one really expected the Clyburn endorsement to um, be as big of a deal as it was, but it was, it was turned out to be huge. Um, and we have, we focus a lot on Clyburn in the book. Um, and one of our, I think our favorite anecdotes um, is, um, you know, everyone kind of expected that Clyburn would come around and endorse him um, at the last minute. Um, but we, what we find out in the book is that it wasn't a sure thing. And um, there was a debate before um, the South Carolina primary that week and Clyburn is there in the audience watching. And um, before the debate, he had essentially told Biden, I want you to talk about um, naming a female black Supreme Court justice. Um, and so he's sitting in the crowd taking in the debate that night and he's seeing that Biden isn't really talking about it. And so a commercial break um, comes and he rushes out of his seat um, and goes to find Biden to essentially tell him, why haven't you done this? There have been so many opportunities where you could have talked about it. Um, and then later um, in, in the debate, he does talk about it right away. So, um, so that is sort of a good moment that kind of shows you um, the concessions that were made and um, what was sort of on the table in order to get this endorsement, this very key endorsement. And Ian, you've, you've read this book, but um, for those who haven't, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of the anecdotes, but I, I promise there's no way that we could get to all of them. <laughs> Uh, in this particular session. And, um, you know, the whole book is that. It it's sort of takes you behind the scenes of the moments that you remember, say a debate or, um, uh, you know, uh, one of the primary contests, um, you know, one of the moments that Trump has on television, what's going on behind the scenes in his hospital room when he has COVID, um, what was going on behind the scenes, um, coincidentally, with Bernie Sanders after he has his heart attack and he's in the hospital and has to figure out um, you know, whether and how to rebuild his campaign. So just just to note that there's literally um, a propulsion through anecdotes in this book. Uh, so let me throw one more at you and then I think it's time to open it up to the audience. Uh, you both covered the, the last presidential where it came out uh, and of course that's the book Shattered. Uh, Biden got more votes than Hillary Clinton did. Uh, so, so did Donald Trump, as it turns out. But was the 2020 race a replay of 2016 without Hillary's unfavorability ratings? Or was it something different? And what might we uh, glean from that? I think it's 
all of these presidential elections are somewhat uh, reflective of the one that came before them, right? Because there's some degree to which everyone's fighting the last war, even when they're trying to fight the new war. But I don't think it's so simple as as just a replay of the last time without Hillary Clinton. I mean, Biden uh, really sort of did his best to find um, a balance between being the establishment insider that was coming in to like restore competence to government and also um, embracing some more populist uh, themes than he, he had before in his career. And I think, you know, trade is one of those, you know, very clear examples of that where Biden had always been a pro-trade senator. Um, he had been on board with NAFTA. He had been um, for the Obama White House had been a um, proponent of the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal. Um, and that had been true of Clinton as well. And Clinton sort of, um, you know, tried to finesse her way on that um, to a place where she was not for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but held open the possibility that she would, uh, you know, change her mind on that. Biden came out pretty hard against, um, pretty hard against trade. And, uh, and so I think there was um, certainly some messaging stuff that he did differently. Um, and given how many people voted for him, um, you know, I think the Democrats have a little bit of a cautionary tale for them in what happened in South Florida, where, uh, where the Democratic margins in Miami-Dade County were very narrow compared to how they usually are, really a loss um, with uh, Hispanic voters, particularly those uh, from Central America. And um, I also think a cautionary tale with African-American voters, given, like I was saying before, given that Biden increased his, um, you know, the Democratic electorate by such a, a large percentage, 20 plus percent, the fact that Democrats are looking at major cities in big states, big swing states, and not seeing um, a, a corollary increase in African American votes, just another segment of the population that um, Democrats probably need to do better with to, be, to secure uh, electoral college majorities in the future. Thank you. So we've got uh, questions coming in. So let me uh, read the first one. Rightly or wrongly, Obama has this lasting do no wrong halo among the Democratic electorate. Can you speak to some more of the lessons learned by Biden from this time campaigning with Obama or the administration? And how might we see this perspective moving forward? It's a good one. John, do you want to take that? I'll think about it as you answer. Um, I mean, I think the halo effect is is dimming. Um, you know, Biden, uh, Biden had to win this election without Obama in the primary. Um, with you know, he was the two-term vice president for the president of the United States and had to walk out there without that support for the second time. Um, and I think that there are a lot of Democrats who were upset with Obama that thought he was too timid. That, that thought he didn't know how to fight Republicans. Uh, and they are starting to give a lot of credit to Biden for pushing this COVID relief bill through. Um, you know, numbers are numbers. Um, Biden had only one chance to get this done with 50 votes in the Senate and, you know, 222 House members on the Democratic side. Um, but as far as narrative goes, I think a lot of the Democrats are looking at Biden as, uh, as being a little more... Um, ambitious for their goals and more, more willing to um, to sort of take on the Republicans. Of course, that's the antithesis of what he campaigned on, but um, his party is happy that once he got in, he is showing himself to be a little more aggressive. And I think what's interesting about Biden during the campaign was that he always sort of campaigned with Obama, even though Obama was nowhere to be found. Um, he would mention Obama. He Obama was all over his website. He really wanted uh, his presence there and he wanted to, to have Obama kind of known and he wanted to make it, you know, emphasize the fact that he was Obama's guy for eight years. And so that was kind of a key part of his campaign. And what's interesting, and John and I report this in the book, is he, he constantly talked about the fact that he asked Obama not to endorse him. Um, and he repeated that, especially as he launched the campaign, because everyone thought it was a little strange that Obama wouldn't endorse his own vice president. And we found out in our reporting in this book that that uh, conversation never really happened. 
Um, so I think Biden kind of wanted to put that out there that it was his idea not to ask Obama to support him. But of course, I think he desperately wanted that. All right, so the next question uh, might hit close to home, especially for you, John, knowing where you live. Uh, given the horrific events of the January 6th storming of the United States Capitol, might Biden consider a strategy of calling out the Trump supporters in Congress? History tells us that negatively labeling a senator can influence voters, which Biden may consider a boost for the midterm elections. Um, it's something he might consider, but it would be very much out of character. I think one of the things that we found in reporting on Biden and just watching him, I think when I say this, I think it'll be familiar to people. He doesn't ridicule or demean his opponents. Um, it's very different than Trump, who spent almost all of his time ridiculing and demeaning Democrats, members of his own administration, uh, people who worked in the White House members of the media, pretty much everybody who didn't look exactly like Donald Trump got demeaned by Donald Trump. Obama used ridicule as a political tool. But Biden is very, very careful about how he talks about adversaries. And in addition to that, he's very careful about how he talks about, uh, the, um, about the supporters of his opponents. You wouldn't catch him talk, say, as Hillary Clinton did, talking about a basket of deplorables. And the, the public official you might go after, the Republican who supported uh, you know, challenging the election results or whatever, they have a lot of constituents. Um, and so it's, a, it's one step away from them to go after the, you know, the actual politician, but it's not so far removed as to uh, potentially, uh, you know, to avoid potentially angering constituents or making constituents feel like they are being picked on. Because after all, they elected the person who is, who's taking the positions they are. So um, I expect you're gonna see very little of Joe Biden personally calling out uh, Republicans. Um, what you might see is other members of Congress on the Democrats, Democratic side doing it, and maybe occasionally outside allies of the White House. Um, but I think it's unlikely to come from inside the White House. So I'm gonna sort of, uh... Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, we're seeing Republicans continue the obstructionist playbook used during the Obama era. How do you see Biden, the unifier, in quotes, react to this approach? I mean, he's having trouble is the short answer right now. He can't, he campaigned on unifying, but he's having a hard time kind of reaching across the aisle. And at the same time, I think he's, he's placating his own base, progressive party, um, part of the party, and they're trying to, um, you know, build support there. But I think even that is fractured and stitched together. And I don't see that holding for a long time. But I think, you know, if anyone is able to kind of make that um, connection with Republicans, I think it's Biden. He knows a lot of these guys for a long time. He's sort of that old school politician who feels like, um, the fever can be broken and he's sort of the guy to do it. I just, it'll be, I'm curious to see how he goes about doing it because they're not, Republicans aren't willing to give him anything at this point. And, and that, um, I think I don't see it getting any easier for him. Well, I'm waiting for questions to show up in my queue. I'm going to take the liberty of one more. Uh, John, you mentioned the always fighting the last war with the next campaign, which is true as we look ahead to the coming midterm elections, which are in full swing at this point, conventional wisdom is the power, party in power loses seats on the Hill. Yet the Senate map looks pretty good for Democrats. Uh, and there's very few seats to really pick off on either side uh, that are, uh, obviously we've got announcements from Toomey in Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin's a question mark, uh, but there's really not a whole lot of opportunity. Uh, what do you sort of see happening in the midterms and how does that sort of play out in the, the Congress we're currently in? Um, number one, we're gonna have to wait to see how redistricting plays out um, uh, based on the last census and how the state legislatures uh, end up drawing maps because that 
should be favorable to Republicans. There should be uh, several seats that they can pick up just as a matter of redrawing the lines. Um, but I guess my way of looking at all of our politics right now is that we are so narrowly divided. Um, and yet every time someone wins an election, uh, regardless of who controls the House, who controls the Senate, who controls the presidency, and what mar by what margin they did that, uh, they claim a mandate. And it seems to me the mandate from the voters collectively is actually to be at odds, right? I mean, there's a, we have a very like even, uh, evenly divided country. And even if you go to 81 million to 74 million in the last presidential election, it's not like a, a huge percentage gap. It's four and a half percent, um, you know, between that separated Biden and, and Trump. And Trump lost the popular vote and, you know, claimed a mandate. And I, I guess I just look at it, I'm like, I'm not surprised it's hard for presidents to legislate when Congress is so evenly divided. Um, and it will be evenly divided after the next election. Uh, there will not be a 60 vote Democratic Senate or a 60 vote uh, Republican Senate. And there won't be a House, there's not likely to be a House majority that is, you know, more than 10 or 15 seats, um, you know, either way of, of the 218 mark. So, you know, we, our Congress reflects the divisions of the voters. So with the don't come back to me if it if it ends up being twenty seats for the Democrats in the House or the or, to, or for the Republicans, don't come back to me because this is not an actual prediction of the numbers. We are way too early to know what those numbers are going to look like. My point is that um, you, you're not going to see one party have have you know the kind of uh, margins that say the Democrats did under Sam Rayburn, you know, forty or fifty years ago or longer than that. John's specialty though is analysis, so I trust him when he when he breaks down the numbers like that. So I don't know, see if he's right. <laughs> uh, so with the polls all over the place and COVID changing the rules of the game, what was the conventional wisdom on the race in 2020 and was it accurate? The conventional wisdom in terms of? The, I, I read the question as uh, winning the White House. Okay, um, well, if the question is about COVID, obviously Biden's campaign had to rewrite um, the playbook for how to win or how to campaign in such a strange election year. Um, and that was a huge problem for them, particularly as they were transitioning from the primary to the general election. But I think, um, and John and I kind of make the point in this book that um, COVID was sort of one of the lucky factors for Biden. And um, the way we explain it is uh, when we talk to people going into the race and even in the primary, even aides were scared about um, Biden's um, ability to make these gaffes or these verbal blunders, have these missteps. That was always sort of one of their big worries. Um, and I think what COVID do, did was it effectively took him off the campaign and he sort of let Trump kind of um, implode by saying crazy things like you should inject yourself with bleach um, while he, you know, even though he took hits for being hiding Biden and kind of hiding in his basement, he was able to um, almost minimize um, his biggest, what even what his advocates thought was one of his biggest um, liabilities, which was making these these gaps. So, and we we talk um, about one one specific anecdote in the book that um, you might have seen reported um, was Anita Dunn, uh, one of his senior advisors, tells an associate at the time, "COVID is the best thing that ever happened to Biden." And in a way, this, she was reflecting a viewpoint that many of them thought internally that this was sort of the best um, kind of thing that would have happened to him by taking him off the trail um, for months and months at a time um, and letting Trump kind of implode on his own. As a public service announcement, I just want to make it clear that you should not inject bleach, disinfect it, or anything else that should not be uh, consumed by your internal organs. Um, I just want to make that 100% clear. Uh, not that Amy said that, but 
every time we bring that up, I just feel like there should be a PSA. Um, and if I could just add uh, on to what Amy said, and I um, associate myself with her uh, comments and have associated myself with her for about eight years now, over three books. Um, the other thing I would say about the conventional wisdom is that conventional wisdom was that Biden uh, was going to win, you know, from very early on in 2020, maybe even before that, people would look at polls and say Biden's doing better uh, in head-to-head -head matchups with, with Trump. You know, he's a few points ahead. And then by 2020, you know, you could see seven, eight, nine points at times. Um, the Biden people did not trust the public polling. They believed that it oversampled, or maybe the better way to put it is they believed it was too optimistic for them with non-college educated whites, and maybe not optimistic enough with college educated whites. And so they, as we report in the book, for I think this is the first time it's ever reported, um, they re they retabulated their uh, their models um, to try to capture what is sometimes you know referred to as the hidden Trump vote. Um, and what they found is that they were, you know, doing when they did that, they were doing worse than the public poll. Um, and then on election night, the race ended up being much closer than even the Biden folks thought. In fact, we have a scene where Greg Schultz, one of Biden's senior aides, uh, is walking home from, uh, you know, walking home to his hotel at, you know, two o'clock in the morning through the streets of Philadelphia on election night, thinking to himself, how am I going to explain to all of these high level Democrats that I lied to them when I told them that Joe Biden could win. Um, so for, uh, it's very easy for people to forget that it took four days to call this election. The networks all have people who are very, very, very good at determining when you can call an election. And they probably could have done it before day four, uh, but this, this dragged out for a while because it was so close. If you take Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin, uh, Biden wins those states by about 43,000 votes. Had Trump won those states, Trump would have had 269 electoral votes. The election would have been thrown to the House of Representatives to decide it, and Republicans control the majority of the House delegations in the House. The very likely outcome is Trump wins. Even if you add in one more electoral vote from Nebraska's second district, uh, the margin, the numbers that Trump needed to get were less than uh, the 77,000 votes that Hillary Clinton would have needed to flip Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin in 2016. This election was, from the perspective of how you build an electoral college majority, closer than the 2016 election was. So and don't, oh, by the way, don't take my word for it. That's what the people, I mean, we wrote the book, but that's what the people inside the Biden and Trump campaigns were telling us. One of them said, one of the Biden people said to us, I knew this was going to be close, but I didn't know how effing close it was going to be. I, you know, cleaned it up, Ian, for uh, for Brookings purposes. We appreciate that. Uh, so despite progress, the U.S. continues to be rife with sexism and racism. Put bluntly, many suggested that the only, quote, type of candidate that could beat Trump was an old white male. How much do you think this played into his favor or was this not an important variable? Hmm. Um, I think it's it's a good point. Uh, actually, one of my favorite quotes, I think, in the entire book is essentially, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like, um, it took basically a black man and a white woman, um, uh, basically, and oh, then what was the the old the old man walks away with the prize. Um, uh, put that I, together with me, John. Can I help you? Yes, please. <laughs> It's been a long day, I'm sorry. In, in reference to Jim Clyburn's endorsement and Elizabeth Warren taking out Mike Bloomberg in a debate uh, right before the Nevada caucuses, um, mm -hmm. one, one source said to us, you know, only in America can the mm -hmm. black man and the white woman do all the work and the old white right. guy will away with the prize. Yeah, which kind of says it all and speaks to where we are. Um, uh, a lot of people kind of feel that way, I think. Um, John, what do you... Uh, it's it's a really tough question. Um, I think it's something the Democrats are really struggling with. Yeah. Uh, that in order to win this election, they needed to nominate a candidate whose background was very centrist. Um, uh, you know, even Democrats who are who's considered themselves centrist are, are often to the left of Biden on social issues. Um, 
uh, and certainly the left of where Biden has been at times in his career on social issues, right? Like he has moved, but when they look at Biden in totality, they'd say, you know, that guy's still like a little, little to the right of me. Um, I, and I think that was like a big struggle for the Democratic Party. And yet at the same time, there was this recognition and this, I guess this fear among a lot of Democrats that if they nominated, nominated someone who shared their values or they nominated someone of color or they nominated a woman or nominated someone of all three of those things, um, they could be very excited about that and uh, watch Donald Trump for four more years from the podium at the White House. So um, I absolutely think that was a factor. There were, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember exactly how many, four, five, six women that ran for president this time. They didn't look at the last election and say to themselves, a woman can't win the presidency. They looked at the last election and said, a woman can win the presidency. But none of them, with the exception of Warren for a brief period in, uh, in late 2019, none of them got the kind of traction that would suggest that they um, could win a nomination or win the presidency. And I think that had a lot to do with an innate fear among Democrats that if they um, did anything other than nominate uh, a white guy, and by the way, the, the, one, the person who came closest other than Biden was Bernie Sanders, another old white guy. And the person who was looked at as the savior uh, by some of the centrists when Biden was struggling was Mike Bloomberg, another old white guy. Um, you know, there wasn't talk of, you know, how do we how do we turn Stacey Abrams into our nominee within the Democratic Party? It was how do we find, um, you know, sort of deus ex machina with the two billion dollar Mike Bloomberg injection um, to uh, to get that done. So I, I think it very it's a great question. I think it very much factored into the thinking of Democrats. And I think it's something that bothers a lot of Democrats that it factored into their thinking or that, um, you know, that they have to go in that, you know, they had to go in that direction, even if it was against their, their values. And it's one of the reasons I think they're so quick to say now that they believe Joe Biden's latest law is the most liberal law. And, you know, I don't know, since, uh, well, they, uh, we keep hearing re uh, references to LBJ and FDR. Um, I don't think it's actually that hard to get uh, Democrats to agree on spending $2 trillion to um, expand benefits for the poor. Like, I feel like that's what makes them Democrats. Uh, so with the apparent role in the 2020 election uh, resulting in increased opportunities to vote due to the pandemic, I'm guessing this question is referring to mail-in, voting early, uh, et cetera. How do you see the ongoing efforts to limit voting affecting the results of the upcoming midterm elections? And I'm, I'm presuming I'm reading into this question myself. They're talking about the press we're hearing coming out of Georgia. Um, it's certainly easier to vote if you vote by mail or vote early. Um, and we saw that in this election. I, I mean, I really think that uh, one of the reasons we saw record turnout in the election was you could turn out for a month or six weeks, so to speak, by mailing in your ballot or dropping it off at a, a, um, a, you know, at a box for early voting. Um, and now the fight, that's where the fight is moving. We're seeing the fight move to um, how do you stop that? Uh, on the Republican side, or how do you stop that in the in the places where you where you want it to stop? Because there are some places where mail-in balloting is really good for Republicans and not as good for Democrats. And uh, you know that sort of also ties into the big fight that we're seeing over voting rights right now. You know, the Democrats have uh, their HR one bill in uh, in the House um, that they're trying to get through the Senate, and they want the filibuster broken so that they can move that through. And that's a, you know it's sort of an expansion or protection of voting rights. Um, on, at the same time, at the state level, you see Republicans working overtime to try to, to make it harder to vote. Uh, Amy, you, you may not recall, but I last saw you face to face the day, the morning after Super Tuesday. I remember. Uh, will we ever see Super Tuesday as it is? Is the electoral map or process going to change? And what what might happen looking four years from now at the next uh, nomination process going into the election? I kind of feel like the Super Tuesday was a bit of an anomaly because um, Democrats, this kind of dovetails with what John was saying earlier, but Democrats sort of figured that they had to do what it took to win um, and beat Trump. And so they threw everything they had behind Joe Biden 
Um, there was this rush to kind of get Bernie Sanders out of the race, which we talk about a lot in the book. Um, and I, I think that's sort of why there were lessons learned, I think, from 2016 also. Um, and it's sort of why you saw Bernie Sanders leave as quickly as he did, because a lot of Democrats kind of blamed him for um, for 2016 and, and how he was hitting Hillary up until June and July. So I do think that it changes um, playing it forward. I do think that it's not going to be um, very much like um, the 2020 election. Um, and I do think that there will be a lot of, I mean, certainly you're going to see Kamala Harris um, in 2024. I think she's already gearing up for that. And I think you'll see um, potentially a, 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 an array of other candidates. I think that this one thing we did learn from this um, race is that everyone, 25 people thought that they could be president. Um, and so I don't expect that part to change. Um, and, and one last question, what, what might not have made the final print of the book that you wish was a good antidote that might have, uh, that you might wanna share? Um, I think it was uh, left out. I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure it got left out. Um, we had some uh, we had some reporting on uh, the Club for Growth, uh, which is a conservative uh, outside group that can, you know that plays in, in elections on behalf of Republicans, and they had uh, they had done some polling on the Democratic side of the race, um, and, and what they were trying to do was figure out how to um, how to divide the sort of two pillars of Biden's primary uh, electorate, one being moderate whites and the others, the other being African Americans. And they thought that perhaps they could message to African Americans about, um, you know, how moderate and centrist Biden was and what he had done on school busing. And what they found was that they couldn't get much traction there because in part, because uh, it seemed that, um, that a lot of the African American voters were, looking at Biden's strength as him being able to appeal to centrist whites. So saying, look, this guy's got a terrible record because he's been a centrist white and he appeals to centrist white. And so he might be able to take some of them from uh, Donald Trump was actually very compelling evidence for why to vote for Biden in the primary for, for many African-Americans who prioritized uh, getting rid of Trump. I mean, it's a, you know, there's a, a real sophistication in the black electorate in this country um, that I think uh, is often overlooked uh, because uh, African Americans tend to vote as a block, certainly in, in general elections for Democrats, um, and often vote as a block for one candidate over the other uh, in Democratic primaries. But I think it's um, it's a I think that what you saw in this election, uh, what proved out in this election, was um, you know sort of the sophistication of seeing of of seeing Biden as uh, the person who was best positioned to beat Trump. I think also one of the hardest things about writing this book so fast is that we keep finding out stuff even now, like a week ago, a source told us something that we wish we had in the book. Um, and it was so tough to, our deadline for this book was much earlier than our last book, Shattered, uh, because we kind of wanted to uh, put this out there almost immediately after the election. So I think one of the toughest parts of uh, this whole process is like that we keep learning about the election and we wish we could um, keep adding to the book, but maybe we'll have to save it for our paperback next year. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we are about out of time. So unless either of you would like to have any final words, I just want to thank both of you for uh, spending time with us and sharing so some thoughts about the book. Encourage everyone to pick up a copy uh, whether it be your neighborhood bookstore, Amazon, or any other online retailer. It's a quick, easy read and has some great antidotes, much like you heard this evening. Amy, John? Um, Ian, if we could just briefly thank you and thank Sam and thank Alicia and Joe and the rest of your team and obviously um, everyone who participated uh, in this uh, discussion today, um, you know, through their questions or or simply listening, uh, we really appreciate it, and um, you know, hope you hope you enjoy the book. And with uh, Mother's Day coming in May and Father's Day in June, since we've both authors are parents, can make some great Mother's Day and Father's Day gifts. <laughs> with yeah. that, St. Patrick's Day, definitely yeah. St. Patrick's Day.
Well, there, there you go. Uh, but also, um, but like I tell um, all the crowds when I do speak is John and I are, are able to talk to you offline. Um, so Ian knows how to find us. And if you want to, if you do read the book, let us know how you like it. We're also on social media, on Twitter, especially. So keep in touch with us and let us know how you're liking the book. And, and read their regular articles and viewership on NBC News and The Hill. Um, with that all, as we continue to live through this unique time, stay safe. Thank you. And we hope to see you virtually or one day face to face back in a program. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian. Okay.